All right, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me get to my assignment for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to start in verse number 14, a, a, an extremely familiar passage of Scripture that all of us have probably not only perhaps read, but we have probably heard even preached. And we're just going to get some fresh light out of it today. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge this way, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. How many did Jesus die for? All. Matter of fact, Paul says it twice. I think you got to pay attention. If someone feels they have to repeat themselves, he's like, I'm trying to explain something to you. Jesus just didn't die for the elect. So get, get your Reformed and Calvinistic theology. Anyway, I'll you. Straighten. He died for all. He didn't die for some. He died for all. Everybody say all. I don't know about you. That's really good news right there. He didn't die just for a few people that would pray a prayer either. He died for all. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Let me stop here a minute. In other words, we don't judge anyone according to what they look like, to what they're wearing. Matter of fact, you know you're sitting in a service that's functioning in a wrong covenant if all they're consumed with is hemlines and hairdos. If they're consumed with whether you got a tattoo or not, okay? If they're pulling something out of the book of Deuteronomy that was never written to you in the first place, it was written for you, and they start beating you up for having earrings in a certain place, or if they're focusing on your outer man, Paul said, we do not do this. Woo, that's good news. In other words, we judge your heart, not your outer man. Huh? And God is the one that is the ultimate judge. Huh? He's like, we, 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 we see what you do on the outside. God is the one that knows everything that's in your heart. And we, we, we do judge fruit, but we don't judge you. Amen? Uh, Paul actually said that. We don't judge those that are without. We do judge those that are within. Why? Because it's fruit. Therefore, from now on, we know no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Now, this is where we get in trouble because we try to take a passage like this, throw it 2,000 years in the future. None of us have ever known Christ in the flesh. He was speaking to people that actually saw Jesus. Yet now we know in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone in Christ, most of your Bibles say is, it's slanted, it's added. If anyone in Christ, a new creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled. Everybody say reconciled. Who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or counting their trespasses or sins to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Uh, Let me just say this, that last verse, just real quickly. I'm not going to preach it, but it's very important for you to understand. Jesus did not literally become sin. That has confused translators. That has confused theologians for years. It is ontologically impossible for God to literally become sin. Actually, the word sin, hamartia, can be translated two ways, sin or sin offering. He did not become sin. I used to preach that. Just just seven years ago, I would get up here and say, on the cross, he became a liar, a thief, a whoremonger, an adulterer. He literally became sin. It actually says he became a sin offering. He did not literally become sin. He became a sin offering once and for all for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That I don't know about you, that helped me a lot when I studied that out. Uh, he didn't literally become sin. He became a sin offering to take care of all sin. That's like really good news. So let me, let me start by saying this. Pastor Shannon did a great job setting this up. I have no doubt. I didn't listen to it, but I already know Pastor Kevin did a great job. Pastor Kevin, I tell him all the time, he's one of the greatest storytellers I ever get around. He comes up with stuff. He remembers everything from his past, his childhood. He comes up with stories. Sometimes I just shake my head, and he's 
crazy funny. And then them big ears. Uh, anyway. <laughs> He's my son. I love him. I'm proud of him. No doubt about it. But one thing that the first 400 years of the church especially put a great focus on, and, and Eastern Orthodoxy and more Eastern thought, which is more scriptural thought, what they put a focus on, they had like three or four main pillars when it came to their belief system, and one of them was beauty. Everybody say beauty. In other words, this is literally how they thought, that if how we live our life, if the message we preach, if how we treat our family, if how we conduct our business, and how we do everything, our neighbors should look at it, and they might say, I don't agree with how you believe, but how you live and what you teach is beautiful. In other words, if the message that we declare does not make people jealous and how we live, then normally it's a good sign that a lot of us, and and a lot of us have also come from different backgrounds, we've come from different churches, and listen, i got to be honest with you, the way I was raised, the message wasn't really beautiful. I mean, turn or burn is not beautiful. God, God, God is really ticked off at you. Actually, he doesn't like you because you're totally depraved and you are a filthy, rotten, stinking, nasty little sinner that he really doesn't want anything to do with. Matter of fact, he wanted to beat the tar out of you, but instead he sent Jesus. He beat the tar out of Jesus, so he didn't have to beat the tar out of you. But now Jesus became his Prozac and turned the Father's frown upside down. He's now in a good mood for you, at, at least for a couple thousand years when he comes back and slaughters everybody. Because that's kind of the theology uh, a lot of times we were raised in, which is very confusing because we're like, so is he good? Is he, is he love? Is he, is he in a good mood or is he in a bad mood? I, I'm not really sure. I'm, because people love to bring out, yeah, but he's also a God of wrath. Yeah, and Romans 1 tells us what God's wrath is. God's wrath is that he turns men over to themselves. In other words, God's like, okay, listen, if, if, if you want to continue down this road, it's going to lead to wrath and it's going to destroy you. Here you go. I'm going to turn you over to yourself because you're going to destroy yourself and, and we already quoted it earlier, God's mercy and compassion. The the prophet said in the Old Testament, true justice is mercy and compassion. So the heart of God functions everything out of is what we're declaring beautiful. Is this actually a good message? Should, should Should it provoke other religions of the world to jealousy? We're not only just to provoke the world to jealousy, but Paul, he was actually also talking about provoking law keepers, the Jews to jealousy, because all of the people that were taught you gotta do this and you gotta do this, you gotta jump through a thousand hoops in order for God to love you and accept you, but when you actually begin to really hear the good news, and the good news is what Paul declared right here, I'm gonna get into it in just a minute, It is so beautiful, it's ridiculous. It is so awesome. Our message and our ministry should be something that people should say, wow, I may not agree with your premise, but that is beautiful. That is is really good news. Matter of fact, the word that is translated gospel in, in world history is a Greek word that was only used like two times in all of Greek literature. And the reason they chose that word is because it's not even just good news. It's actually too good to be true news. And, and, and how many know it's only used two times in Greek literature because there's not a whole lot of stuff that's too good to be true? But he said, this message is too good to be true. And so let me set this up. Paul is speaking here to the church, and he starts saying, he said, Christ died for all. He didn't die for just a few. This work was for the whole world. And by the way, it was for the whole world before they ever prayed a prayer and before they were ever born. Aren't you glad that this happened before you were ever born? That's why the good news is declaring something that already took place. So you and I, it's not that we still don't need to hear it and believe it, but our believing it does not make it true. It's already true. Your believing it makes it a reality. If you don't believe it and activate it, it doesn't become alive in you and you walk around living your life like an orphan when you're actually a son because you don't even understand your identity and the gospel is announcing something to people that is so amazing and so beautiful that it should cause them to be jealous. You can, you look at almost every major religion, nearly every major religion, it is 
people cutting themselves and you got to do you got to do this this and this to get to nirvana you got to you got you got to be you got to be reborn and reincarnated a hundred times until you finally get this thing right so then you can finally get where you need to go or or it's 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 so much works based that that when you actually hear the beautiful good news it's almost like wait a minute man this seems too good to be true, my, my father, who I love, he's pastored for over 53 years, and I remember when him and I were having discussions about, about grace, I gave him a book one time. I said, Dad, I really encourage you to read this. About a month later, I called him on the phone, and I said, hey, have you got into that book? And he said, I've read three chapters. I said, okay, well, that's awesome. Well, he said, I read a chapter, and I throw it in the corner. I said, why do you throw it in the corner? He said, it can't be that easy. Because he was raised in a system that taught you how to be a human doing and not a human being. He's like, it can't be this easy. I said, Dad, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. This is not a a heavy thing. It's actually a very beautiful thing. And so I want to talk about our ministry and our message. Paul tells us that our ministry is reconciliation. Everybody say reconciliation. Now, now, let me give you just a a few definitions because I I believe it's extremely important. Uh, This is few definitions for reconciliation. Restored to favor. Atonement, to receive into or the exchange of coins. That's why at the end of the month, if you still use a checkbook or if you go online, you reconcile your books. The Greek word is apokatalasso, and it involves two parties reconciling or being brought into favor with each other to be fully reconciled. There's also two main words, apokatalasso, reconciliation, reconciled, is katalasso, which is better translated conciliation, and this is what it means. It expresses the thought that one party has initiated the reconciliation and brought into favor from their end. Conciliation is a one-sided piece that is done outside the will or knowledge of the other party or person. It is when one party decides to forgive the other, drop the case against them, and wave the white truce of peace and then ask for a reconciliation from the other one in return. If they respond, then it is an apokatalasso or a reconciliation. So God in Christ already from him towards us made up his mind. I'm at peace with you and I'm good with you whether you respond or not. I don't know about you, that's a pretty beautiful message. It's, it's not God is up in heaven and he's this, he's this Zeus with lightning bolts ready to strike you down and he's got a long white beard and he's in a really bad mood and he only smiles every once in a while when you praise him or when you show up to church and you give him the offering. The truth is, he's got a big grin on his face on a regular basis. He's a good, good father and his heart is towards not just you because you prayed a prayer, but his heart towards the whole world is you have favor with me i got to be honest with you, that's not a message I was raised with. I was not raised with a message of, matter of fact, we were taught to knock on doors and say, if you died tomorrow, where'd you go? <laughs> it, was, it was knocking on a door. It was giving them the Ten Commandments first because they're going to convince you that you're a dirty, filthy, rotten, nasty, depraved, horrible dog because until I can convince you that you're a horrible dog, you won't really know what you need to be saved from. And, and the truth is, it's because Western thought has, has hijacked a lot of the gospel because especially from the Reformation on, and I thank God for the Reformation and the Protestant movement because they, they, they shifted a lot, but, but, but the first 400 years of the church was a total different mindset. They put the focus not on the cross, but on the resurrection. They're, they put the focus on the problem with the world was not a sin problem, it was a death problem. The problem was you would die. What Adam brought into the world was not sin. He brought death into the world. That's why they put a focus on the resurrection because he said, listen, man, this is something that needs to be dealt with. That's why Jesus said the gates of Hades, the gates mistranslated hell, the gates of the grave will not prevail against the church. All he was saying is this, you know what? You're not going to die. You don't have to go and just hang out in the grave anymore and wait for the Messiah to come. The Messiah is here, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Matter of fact, Paul actually said the just and the unjust. Everybody goes stands before him. What happens after that? I'm glad it's up to him and not me. I have absolutely no idea. All I know is now that I believed, I have no fear to stand before God on judgment day. 
Woo, isn't that good news? I'm telling you, that's like really good news. After that, we leave that all up to him. That's, that's his purpose. I'm glad that the, Jesus said, uh, you know, Paul, Paul he said, I've, I have, the Father has given all judgment into my hands. In other words, all judgment was placed in Jesus' hands. And Jesus one day said, and I judge no man. That's kind of interesting. But you see, the gospel is all about that God conciliated us in Christ. Let me tell you, when I got a hold of this, my conversations on airplanes changed. Rather than sit and try to convince someone how much they need Jesus, I start to tell them, do you know that you already have favor with God? They're like, huh? What do you mean I have favor with God? Yeah, God reconciled. He brought you into favor 2,000 years ago. Because of what God did in Christ, You, the world has favor with God. See, we don't even like that because we love the us and the them. I have favor and you don't, nan, and a boo-boo. Jesus loves me. He hates you. I said this when I was here last month. Isn't it interesting that God never tells us to love his enemies? He tells us to love our enemies. Maybe because God doesn't have any enemies. How do we know that? Because no greater love is this than a man lay down his life for his friends. And how many know he laid down his life for everybody, so all he has is friends? Come on, get a hold of that. All he has is friends. Now, now we are enemies of God, according to Colossians 2, in our minds. It is, it is man, it's always been man towards God, God in the garden. Man, 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 one, of, one of these times over the next year, so I'm, I'm going to have to do, as a whole, whole message I do called, it's just an illustration called the gospel in chairs. And there's other people that have done it, but I kind of have my own version of it. Just to show that it, it's, not been, it's not been God turning from man. It was always man turning from God. God in the garden did not run from man. He still ran towards man in all of our sin. It was man that then turned. Adam hid from God. God didn't hide from Adam. God, God, God did not, when Cain killed Abel, God didn't come to wipe, a, wipe Cain out. He came and he, he put his finger on his sin, touched his forehead to protect him, gave him grace in the midst of it rather than take him and wipe him out. There, there, there's reasons for that. It wasn't God as much being against us. It was we thought God was doing stuff. That's why Isaiah even says we esteemed him smitten of God. We thought on the cross God was killing God to appease God. But it says we esteemed him smitten. It doesn't say God smote him. It says we thought God was doing this to him. Simply because ancient thought, they believed everything came from God, good, bad, and ugly. So they blame God. If you had a storm, they blame. Well, folks are still doing that today. If a hurricane hits, God must be mad. Boy, God, he's still getting after New Orleans because of Bourbon Street. <laughs> of course, most of those storms hardly touch Bourbon Street. <laughs> Normally touches the poor areas. It's down the seventh ward. I, I was down there. Reconciliation. He said, this is our message, and it's our ministry. You know what our message to the world is? You have favor with God. You have favor with God. Maybe if we'd stop going to the gay pride parades with signs screaming, God hates queers. And we'd actually do what a few of the churches that are part of our network did this last month. They went to the parades and held up big signs, and, and everybody had on mom hugs and dad hug T-shirts, and the pastors had pastor hug T-shirts, and they, and, and they literally hugged more than 1,000 people who had been rejected by their pastors, who'd been rejected by their parents, because we love to put the focus on people's sin. But I'm going to read it in just a minute, and I read it to you. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. In other words, God is not sin-focused. Your sin does not keep you from God. God runs towards sin, not from sin. Where sin abounds, grace, which is a person, superabounds. He runs towards you in your mess, not away from you. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He hung out with unquestionable people. He didn't hang out with Christians because there were none yet, but that's, that's another. Huh? That's absolutely. Because Jesus is sitting in this room and his heart is for the world, for God so loved Man, the way I was raised, God, hey, come out and be ye separate. That was our favorite sermon. 
We were constantly coming out. Never coming in, but we were constantly coming out of something. I mean, it was come out and be separate. But yet, we take those verses out of context because what the book of Revelation is telling us to come out of is come out of Babylon. Come out of religion. Come out of a confused mindset. Come out of, come out of that mess. Not come out of the world. For God so loved the world. It's almost like the church has been taught to hate the world, but God loved the world. John says we're to hate the things that are in this world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Not we're not to hate the world, we're to hate the things that are trying to destroy the world. So the heart of God is I've declared a katalasa over you. I already have released favor to you, whether you like it or not. I sat in an airplane sitting next to an atheist, and I started sharing that with him. He said, wait a minute. He said, I went to seminary. I was raised in church. He said, I've never heard a preacher in my entire life ever tell me that I have favor with God. He said, there's no way I have favor with God. I, 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 matter of fact, I was told I got to repent first. I got to be baptized. I got to jump through 10 hoops before I have favor with God. I said, that's not what Paul said. And I broke it down to him and showed him. And I said, this is even what the Greek word says. And he's like, you are kidding me. And he says, that's actually pretty good news. And I'm like, you mean it's beautiful? He said, actually, that's kind of, it's kind of beautiful. He said, I wish I would have ran into you about 25 years ago. He said, I've had this whole belief system because I've thought that God was against me. Listen, sin will not keep you from heaven because God's not counting your sins against you. The only thing that may keep anyone from heaven is that they never received Jesus who took care of their sin. And that again, that's all up to him. So we've got these whole ideas. God was in Christ reconciling. Our message is to the world, and it is God is not counting your sins. You know what that's actually translated? He's not counting your sins, your trespasses. Now watch this. He's not counting your falling away. He's not counting your missteps. Some of you feel, I don't trespass anymore, but you probably misstep. You probably had a few lapses this last week. Huh? I guarantee you probably had a few lapses. You might not trespass anymore. You might not feel like you're a sinner or anything else, but, but you might have had a few lapses in judgment. You, you might have said a few things to your spouse you wish you hadn't have said. You might have did some things you wish you hadn't have done. Listen, it, it, when Paul is saying God's not counting your sin against you, he's not making light of it either. He's not saying, well, now woo, you can just go out and sin and do whatever you want. Sin still leads to death. Sin still leads to destruction because sin is more about what goes on with you and your neighbor than it does between you and God. Behold the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. Listen, J- Jesus took care. Between God towards us, there's not a sin issue. But us towards each other, there's a reason why James says, confess your faults one to another, that you might be healed. Not confess your faults to God, because the truth is, I mean, you can tell God all day long, but he, he didn't remember any of them. He's kind of got amnesia. He's like, hey, listen, if you want to tell me, that's fine, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Because he cast all your sin as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. So, so listen, confessing your sin, the word confess actually means to say the same as. So if you, if you were raised like I was raised I've, every night, man, I mean, I, before I go to bed, I said, God, forgive me for all my sin. Forgive me for everything I did or did not do, say or did not say. Sins of omission, sins of commission. I just want to make sure I covered all of them. Now, listen, if that makes you feel better, To do that, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I mean, I've had people say, you shouldn't even do that. Why? I mean, listen, if that helps you, knock yourself out and do it. But the truth is, it doesn't do anything with God towards you. It might help you towards God. But it doesn't help God towards you because he's not holding your sin against you. Can you imagine if people would actually realize you have favor with God and God is not holding your issues against you? I don't know about you. That is like... Amazing. Because you know what? People hold your issues against you. You hold your issues against you. Our biggest critic is ourselves. Our biggest struggle sometimes is, is not trying to, trying to see whether God's doing something. It's we self-condemn ourselves. We are self-deceived. We, we, we do things to ourselves, and then it affects how we treat other people. Listen, I, I, I tell people all the time, God doesn't have an issue with your sin. He removed all your sin. He became the sin offering once and for all. But it doesn't mean that your sin still doesn't have an effect. Your sin may not send you to hell, but your sin is going to make you feel like you're living in hell while you're here. 
because you keep doing dumb stuff, you're going to keep reaping dumb stuff. You, listen, you, 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 go, you, go, you go out and, and you steal from your neighbor, you sleep with your neighbor's wife. Listen, there's going to be consequences for your silliness. And it's normally relational. It doesn't change how God views you. It changes how people view you. That's like when a preacher, when a preacher messes up, the gifts and calling God are without repentance. They're they're still gifted. They're still called. They're still anointed. But people don't receive from them in a certain way simply because of what they went through. God doesn't remember your sin, but boy, people do a good job. That's a good place for an amen or an oh me. Especially folks you grew up with. Well, those are folks, man, they still see you the same way. I got a kick out of it during, during, during the conference. Apostle Dan, uh, he got up and he said, Man, he said, during the worship when little Brittany, <laughs> he, he still, he, he knew her ever since she was this tall. He still, he's still seeing little Brittany. We do that. My roommate in Bible school, his name is Stephen. I still call him Stevie. Because uh, we went to Bible school together. He's still Stevie to me. Why? Because when I first met him, he was Stevie. And, and even though he's now a grown man and, and, you know, he's got a family, he's a pastor of a church, and everybody else calls him Stephen, he's still Stevie to me. God was in Christ reconciling, bringing the whole world into favor. Can you imagine if the whole body of Christ started sharing that message with their neighbors, their family, and their friends? Rather than, rather than screaming at them, rather than being good street preachers? Hmm? Rather than getting bullhorns and screaming how mad and angry God is on a regular basis, what would actually happen if people would say, do you know that you have favor with God because of what Christ did at the cross? Do you know that God is for you? He's not against you. You know that there's nothing that can separate you from his love. He's a stalker you can't get away from no matter how hard you try. He'll chase you down. He'll leave the 99 to run after you. Do you know who this Abba is that you're running from, man? Why are you running? Stop running. Get caught. He's too good, and it's too good to be true. God was in Christ, our ministry and our message. You see, I, the way a lot of us have been when it comes to church is when people hear ministry. Jesus talked about the ministry. Paul talked about the ministry, but never explained what the ministry was until 2 Corinthians 5. Talks about fivefold ministry. God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the work of the ministry, but he actually doesn't really tell us what the ministry is until 2 Corinthians 5. He says, We've been given a ministry of apokatalasso. We've been given a ministry of bringing favor to humanity. So our ministry is not the ones that are trying to irritate the world. We're supposed to make them jealous. We're supposed to be the ones that are bringing such amazing good news that they can't help but want to be a part. They're like, I don't know what it is about them folks, but man, they have a blast when they get together. One, one thing I loved, I mean, our, our, our church in Saginaw, we would always go out to eat uh, after the Sunday nights, especially when, when I was home the few weeks out of the month. And, and, and you know, the, the first of the month, you know, we'd have 30 or so just because that's when folks had some money. Hallelujah. <laughs> We were in the city. And uh, then, I mean, we'd have 30, 40 people go out to eat. And, I mean, normally the waitresses would be like, man, you guys are like a hoot. You guys are a blast. I mean, I mean, we built relationships. A lot of times we'd walk in, and they had already had a whole bunch of church folk all day Sunday afternoon who were leaving them tracks and a penny. And, like, absolutely just not representing Jesus at all. And we come in, we'd be all acting crazy, having a good time, make sure to leave them an extra big tip because we knew that we were going to need to make up for all the crazy Christians. Hmm? I love that culture. People, Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy among all of his brethren. We should be like the most fun people on the planet. People should be like, these people are a walking party. Isn't it amazing? Jesus did a lot of his best work at parties. Always. Matter of fact, you said one time the kingdom of God is like a man who threw a great party. Matter of fact, when the prodigal came home, the first thing the father did, let's throw a party. He didn't say, where you been, you filthy, rotten little heathen? You've been running from me. I'm just ticked off of you. He's like, hey, it's party time. He's home. That's like beautiful. What an amazing Abba that we serve. God 
was in Christ, bringing the world into favor with him. And when I was with you the last time, I, I talked about something, and I'm going to start winding this down. We talked about the difference between what theology calls objective and subjective. There's objective truth and there's subjective truth. Objective truth is everything's all done. The truth is everybody God is going to save, heal, deliver, reconcile, redeem happened 2,000 years ago. Pastor Shanna quoted it, Colossians chapter 2. When you were dead in your trespasses, he quickened you, made you alive, and completely forgave you. That happened before you were ever born. Someone please say amen. All right, Ephesians 2 says the same thing. While you were still a sinner, while you were still in your trespasses, he quickened you, made you alive, for by grace you are saved. All right, He's, he made this extremely clear. As a matter of fact, it tells the same thing in Romans chapter 5. Because of one man's trespass or one man's sin, Adam's, all were made unrighteous. But now because of one man's righteous deed, Jesus's, all are made righteous. King James says many because they didn't want to interpret that as all because they wanted to keep some us in them. Truth is, this was done for all of humanity. One died for all, so all died. First John chapter 2, he didn't just die for us, but he died for the sins of the whole world. Objectively, it's all true. Matter of fact, there's more than 100 verses in the Bible that talk about the reconciliation and salvation of all of humanity. There's a reason why people that are called universalists that believe that, that everybody's already good and everybody's already in, they have a lot of scriptures for it. Okay, you got to understand something. It's not a little part of the Bible, and it's never been refuted except the last hundred years with fundamentalists as heresy. They just believe that what God did was a little bit bigger than what everybody else believed. But they're preaching the objective side, and they don't include the subjective. Objectively, everyone was healed 2,000 years ago. But subjectively, my back hurts. Subjectively, my mom got cancer. All right, yeah, by his stripes you were healed. This happened at the cross. Everything Jesus did, he's already, he's not doing anything else. He already did everything. It is finished. All right, he took care of all of it. But subjectively, it's manifested by grace. That's what Jesus did through faith. So if I don't believe it, then I never enjoy the benefits of it. Believing it is still extremely important. It's why Paul in 2 Corinthians tells us that God reconciled the whole world, brought the whole world into favor. But then he goes on to say, but now we that have received that as ambassadors, we beg people, be reconciled. In other words, believe it. God is good with you, but you need to be good with God. I like to put it like this. The whole world has been reconciled, but the whole world is not saved. Because sozo, salvation, is wholeness, completeness, deliverance, healing, and health. You see, true universalism says everybody's already saved. I don't know about you, there's a whole lot of jacked up folks on the planet. I don't know about you, I don't see everybody as healed, delivered, whole, and complete. I don't know about you, there's a whole lot of us sitting in here right now that are not whole, complete, fully delivered, healed. Why? Because we're working out our salvation. We're saved and we're still being saved. It's a, he's working this thing out of us, this incredible life. It's finished 2,000 years ago, but my believing it is still extremely important because if I believe it, it never becomes a reality in my life. That's why objectively it's done. Subjectively, it still needs to be a manifestation in my life. That's why without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. It's not either or, it's both and. It brings the idea of grace and faith, and it marries both of them. The reason it tells us in Hebrews 4 is that they never enter the promised land. Is God did the work for them in the wilderness, they never enter the promised land because they never mix the promise with faith. That's why we still, there's incredible benefits in believing. Someone please say Amen. All right, there's all, there's verses. That's why what you have is you have people sit and fight and argue with each other. Like, it's already done. I don't need to do anything. And the people over here are like, well, yeah, but it says, well, they that believe, they that believe, they that believe, they that believe. It's not either or, it's both and. Is this helping anybody? See, that's why when you read those verses that confuse you, like, you were quickened and made alive and completely forgiven while you were still dead. I mean, I don't know about you. Maybe you read over those verses. I don't. I read them and say, now, wait a minute. You're telling me 
that this was already finished before I even knew anything about Jesus? Yes. But when I learned about Jesus and I believed it, it became a reality. That's why the whole world has been reconciled. That's our message to the world. Not God is angry and ticked off with you and he doesn't like you. It's like he already brought you into favor. Man, I wonder what would happen if the church would start preaching that. We might actually have some people want to be around us. They'd be like, are you serious? God's not against me. He's actually for me. Yes. Because of the finished work of the cross, God was in Christ reconciling the world. And let me give you even better news. He's not counting your issues against you. He's not holding He's not holding your sin, your missteps, your lapses. People will. You will. You need to work it out with people. You jacked it up. You sowed it. You're going to reap it. Someone say amen. Listen, this, <laughs> this isn't just to say, well, praise the Lord. Now there's no sin, so we need to worry about it. No, no, sin still affects people. But it mainly affects our relationships. And it blows me away how we have been made ministers of reconciliation, and there's people that go to church together that sit on one side of the church that haven't talked to people on the other side of the church for 10 years. I go to churches all the time, and there's Hatfields and McCoy sitting right in the same building. Folks like fighting with each other, like they got offended 10 years ago with each other, they ain't even looked at each other for 10 years. It's like, no, no, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to model this thing. We're the ones that bring favor between humans. We're the ones that are the ones saying, whoa, whoa wait a minute, when the two parties are fighting, we're like, wait a minute, peace be still. We step in the situation and bring reconciliation. We don't step in the situation and try to make it worse. That's the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ is let's bring healing and wholeness and health and let's restore relationships. Let's restore peace because the sons of God are the peacemakers. We're not the peacekeepers. We're there to make peace And he's given us this amazing gospel of peace to be able to do it. God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself, not holding their sins against them. Whenever I get around Christians and all they want to do is focus on everybody's issues, it lets lets me know they're, they're functioning in mixture. They're still functioning under, many times, a wrong covenant. And they're putting their focus on the sin in people rather than the sun in people. My job is not to speak to the sin in you, it's to speak to the sun in you. The gospel, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, is now, it's a message of affirmation, not a message of condemnation. So if I'm, if I'm being condemned, it's normally, it's normally a message that is a message of death and it's not a message of life. I, I literally, literally had, I, I will never forget this, had a young lady that grew up in my parents' church and she'd not been to church in years. And she said to her sister one day, I need to get back in church. And she, her sister said, you know, you got to go check out, uh, uh, you know, Jamie's church over there in Saginaw because that's where you live. She said, no, she's, I, I don't think I can go there. And she's like, why? Well, I've heard all they talk about over there is love. She's like, I just don't feel like I've been to church if I've not just got beat up once in a while. And I'm like, you realize, like, you're sick in the head. All right, there, there's a dysfunction going on in you. It's like, well, you know, I love my husband, but I just don't really feel he loves me until he beats me up every once in a while. I mean, what kind of sick thinking is that? That's literally how people feel. Well, if I don't come under some kind of conviction. It's like, really? Well, the conviction should be convincing you that you're righteous, not that you're a sinner. The conviction is he convinces the world of sin. He convinces us. Jesus starts speaking to then the disciples, you of righteousness. He's like, I'm trying to convince you you're better than you think you are. I'm trying to convince you why you're acting like that. Don't you know who you are? You're a son. Sons don't act like that. Hmm? Like when my kids were little, it's like you're an Engelhart. Engelharts don't act like that. And then sometimes they do something, and, and I'd say, where do you get that? And they'd look at me, and I'd be like, well, I guess Engelharts do act like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, we teach it, we know, we reproduce who we are. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> they got that from me. Oh, boy. God was in Christ reconciling the world. Our message should be so beautiful. It should be such amazing good news that people are attracted to us. They're running 
towards us. They're not running away from us. If you were to, if you were to take your phone down to Myers or Walmart today and you were to interview some people and ask them, tell me a little bit about God, the church, and Christians, I, I bet you'd rarely hear, oh, man, some of the most amazing, kind, loving people non-judgmental I've ever heard. You're normally going to hear judgmental. You're normally going to hear angry. We, we, we have a lot to undo because we've not been declaring the gospel. We've been preaching more bad news than good news. I've been preaching now almost 29 years, and I had to admit after 22 years I didn't even really understand the gospel. I know a lot of men my age that won't even admit that. We'd rather be so prideful to say, no, I got this thing all figured out. I'll be in the middle of a sermon sometime, and I'll stop, and I'll say, wait a minute, everything I just said the last three minutes, I don't believe none of that no more. Don't pay no attention to it. Why? Because when you get indoctrinated your whole life with one way of thinking, it don't go away overnight. That old language comes out of you. The old way of thinking comes out of you. Because we've had so much confusion between the covenants, and, 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 and it's, it's brought complete, complete and utter confusion. But the good news is, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. But now we that have received that, we are ambassadors of a beautiful message. That's why Paul said he's given us the message of reconciliation to let the world know, be reconciled. You've been conciliated. God towards you, good. God towards you, peace. You towards God, that's why, listen, this is very important. It's why it says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not reconciling himself to the world. He wasn't the one that had the problem. We are the ones that had a problem. That's a huge difference because a lot of how the gospel was presented to me most of my life, including in Bible school, was God was the one that was always angry at us. He had the issue with us, so he sent Jesus to take care of his issues with us because he had a 5,000-year anger issue. Because his kid messed up one time, he was ticked off at him and all of his descendants for almost 5,000 years. Even though God is love and love is not easily angered. But somehow he was ticked off for 5,000 years. Come on, think about that just for a moment. Listen, man, this set me free when I realized this. If someone deceived my child into believing something about themselves or something about me that was not true, would I be angry at my child or the one who deceived him? That's why God's anger was not towards us. The cross was to deal with sin, death, and the devil. That's why Hebrews Hebrews tells us he came to destroy the works of the devil, and that took care of also sin, and it was the one that held the keys of death, which was the devil. Now, no matter what your theology of the the devil as an individual, an entity, a thing, a mindset, it, it doesn't matter. It says Jesus came to destroy the works completely of the accuser. Some believe that's the law, all kinds of thoughts about that. It really doesn't matter. All I know is they were deceived in the garden to believe something about them that wasn't true of them. And so God's anger was at death. It was at sin. It wasn't at us. And so when we read verses that actually say things, the opposite. Man, listen, one thing that set me free, and and someone come play the piano. Well, start to shut me up. Please, thank you. One thing that set me free, I was in my 20s. I got completely confused reading the Old Testament. I'd been preaching like crazy, completely confused because I would read 2 Samuel. It says God never takes life. He only gives life. And about four verses later, God opened the earth, swallowed, killed 3,000 people. And I'm like, what's going on here? Until my dad one day, he gave me a Young's Concordance. Like, I, I don't use Strong's too often because he really wasn't very good with Greek. I prefer the Young's Concordance. And at the beginning of the Young's Concordance... Young has a forward in there, and he says this. When you read the Old Testament, and you're reading Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, there's something called called the causative tense and the permissive tense. In other words, so whenever you're reading a passage that is Hebrew, you can either interpret it 
according to the context as something being caused by or something being permitted by. The wrath of God is God turning men over to themselves. When men continue to do dumb stuff, God's like, if that's what you want, my hands are off now. You won't listen to me. I've sent you the prophets. I've sent you my Messiah. I've sent you all this. And you just keep doing this over and over again. And, and, and there's something called sowing and reaping that is still a principle on the planet. You put corn in the ground, you're going to get some corn back. Seed time and harvest, as long as the earth remains. That, 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 that's a principle, just, just like gravity is a principle. It's something that is, that is real. And when it dawned on me that it wasn't God causing all this stuff, but because of man choices, God permitting by God taking his hand off. All of a sudden, it realized that when they said in the Old Testament, God killed them, but then Jesus shows up and says, it's the thief that kills. I've come that you might have life. In other words, me and daddy aren't about killing, we're about life. And no man has seen God at any time until Jesus showed up. In other words, anything you thought about God, the Father that doesn't look like Jesus, it's either a misinterpretation or you're missing it. Because once you realize God's not the cause of pain, someone please say amen. God's not, he's not out there trying to harm us. He's a good father who says, I know the plans I have for you, the plans to prosper you, harm you, to give you hope in the future. I'm not the cause of your issues. I'm not the cause of your pain. There's things because of rebellion and because of your choices I can't do anything about. It's like us as parents. Listen, I'm telling you, your theology changes when you become a parent. Before I was a parent, man, I was hardline. After I had some children. And when your children don't do what you say, over and over and over again, and you still love them and it breaks your heart, Huh? It breaks your heart when they're making dumb decisions. You, you know that you know what it does on the inside of you. Imagine how the Heavenly Father feels. There's times you're like, what are you doing? But our love never changes. Our love and acceptance, that, that has something that is real. It's raw. It's the heart of Heavenly Father that aches and says, man, I'm only telling you this because I don't want you to bring harm into your life. That's why, that's why all the time, it's like Katie, when she's with, when she's with Wendy and I, we go on to walk straight and I hold our hand and the time she says, no, we're like, baby, we're not asking you to do this because we're trying to hurt you. We're trying to teach you something because we, we don't want a car to run you over. All right. We, we want, we want, no. And yet, look at the patience of the Heavenly Father. How many times we tell him, no, 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 no. And he's like, he's still passionately in love with us. When we make dumb decisions, it doesn't turn him from us. It actually keeps his heart turned towards us. We turn from him. He don't turn from us. There's no shadow of turning. We did that series last year. His heart is always passionately pursuing Because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He didn't need to reconcile his heart to us. He's trying to reconcile our heart back to him. So maybe maybe, maybe you're here and you've, you've been in this house a while and you've been hearing good news. And you just need to know that you have favor with God whether you feel like it or not. You might feel like you're going through hell and earth right now. But you still have favor with God. God's not turned from you never has his heart has always been passionately for you but there's a difference between now your heart turning towards him be reconciled he already reconciled you but there's still a response on our end and and the good news is is it doesn't change his mind even if we even if we stick our tongue out at him if we flip him off it doesn't It doesn't change his mind. He still is facing us. His heart is still passionate for his kids. But then he asks us that are believers, my desire for you is would you please be ambassadors of this message? Be ambassadors of reconciliation. Don't don't scream at your neighbor. Don't scream at the world. Don't scream at and other Christians that don't believe the way that you believe. I 
remember about 10 years ago, Holy Spirit said to me, he said, you've got a lot of room at your table for prostitutes and publicans and all kinds of mess, but you're not making room for Pharisees. And I was like, ugh. It's always the religious that have irritated me the most. That's why I ran from God for five or six years. I wasn't running from Jesus. I was running from church folk. I don't want anything to do with church. I never not wanted anything to do with Jesus. But there are all kinds of Pharisees also believe Jesus made room at his table for the people that were all jacked up in the world and folks that were jacked up on religion. Our heart is that God still has favor with you even though you get on my last nerve. Hmm? God's favor has nothing to do. That's why, you know, you think because you got a parking spot in the front of Myers, ooh, the favor of God. Listen, all kinds of folks that don't know Jesus get front parking spots on a regular basis. <laughs> he got nothing to do with the favor of God. Matter of fact, if you're good and healthy, why don't you park out a little further so someone who's got a limp could park a little closer than don't have a handicap spot. That's more the heart of Jesus. Hmm? But see, God was in Christ bringing the whole world into favor. The whole world has been reconciled, but the whole world is not saved. We preach the gospel because we want people to get saved. And salvation is not about the afterlife. It's about this life. I don't need to be healed in heaven. I don't need to be delivered in heaven. I don't need prosperity in heaven. I need all that here and now. That's why we preach the gospel to people. We don't preach the gospel to people because we're trying to get them out of hell. We preach the gospel to people because we want them to enjoy eternal life. We want them to enjoy a relationship with God, a reconciled relationship. This is not an issue of where you go just when you die. This is an issue of how you live while you're here. And if I care about you, I want you to have your best life now. Good Joel Osteen quote. I want you to live the abundant life right here, right now. So I want to encourage you this week, this month, this year. Let people know. Do you know you have favor with God? Do you know God's not angry with you? Do you know that he's not holding all of your mess against you? I guarantee you, you'll get deer in headlight looks. Because most people have been around some Christians at one time or another who told them God didn't like them at all. God was pretty angry with them. Matter of fact, a lot of people come to church feeling depressed and leave more depressed. Rather than leaving feeling lifted up, knowing that God's heart for them never changes, even when their heart does. He's faithful to us even when we're unfaithful to him. He won't deny you because Paul said to Timothy, he can't deny himself, so he won't deny you. That's the heart of God.